Travels of Marco Polo, Book 2, Chapter 27, of the help given by the Emperor to all provinces in times of dearth. Every year, the Great Khan sends his commissioners to find out whether the crops of any of his subjects have suffered from unfavorable weather, windstorms, violent rains, locusts, worms, or any other plague. And in such cases, he not only does not exact the usual tribute, but furnishes them from his granaries with as much corn as they need for subsistence, as well as for sowing their land. With this in view, in times of great plenty, he has large purchases made of the most useful kinds of grain, which is stored in granaries provided for the purpose in the several provinces, and managed with such care as to ensure its keeping for three or four years. He commands that these granaries always be kept full in order to provide against times of scarcity, and when at such time he sells the grain, he asks no more four measures than the purchaser would pay for one measure in the market. Similarly, where there has been a loss of cattle in any district, he makes good the loss out of his own which he has received as his tenth other provinces. All his thoughts, indeed, are directed towards assisting the people whom he governs, that they may be able to make a living and improve their substance. We must not omit to notice, as a peculiarity of the great Khan, that where lightning has struck any herd of cattle, flock, sheep, or other domestic animals, whether the property of one or more persons, and however large the herd may be, he does not demand the tenth of the increase of such cattle during three years. So also, if a ship laden with merchandise has been struck by lightning, he does not collect from her any custom or share of her cargo, considering the accident an ill omen. God, he says, has shown himself to be displeased with the owner of the goods, and he is unwilling that property bearing the mark of divine wrath should find its way into his treasury. Chapter 28 of the trees he causes to be planted at the roadsides. There is another regulation of the great Khan that is both ornamental and useful. On both sides of the public roads, he has men plant trees of a kind that become large and tall, Besides giving shade in summer, they mark the road when the ground is covered in snow, and this is of great assistance and comfort to travelers. This is done along the high roads wherever the soil allows, but when the road lies through sandy deserts or over rocky mountains where it's impossible to have trees, he orders stones to be placed and columns erected as landmarks. He also appoints officers whose duty it is to see that all these are properly cared for and the roads kept in good order. Besides the reasons already mentioned, it may be added that the Great Khan is the more inclined to plant trees because astrologers tell him that those who plant trees are rewarded with long life. Chapter 29 of the Rice Wine of Cathay Most of the inhabitants of the province of Cathay drink a sort of wine made from rice mixed with a variety of spices and drugs. This beverage, or wine as it may be termed, is so good and well-flavored that they do not wish for better. It is clear, bright, and pleasant to the taste, and being taken very hot can make one drunk sooner than any other wine. Chapter 30 Concerning the Black Stones Dug in Cathay and Used for Fuel Throughout this province there is found a sort of black stone, which they dig out of the mountains, where it runs in veins. When lighted, it burns like charcoal and retains the fire much better than wood. It may indeed be kept going during the night and in the morning be found still glowing. These stones do not flame except a little when first lighted, but while burning give out a considerable heat. There is no scarcity of wood in the country, but the population is so immense and their stoves and baths, which they are continually heating, so numerous, that the quantity could not supply the demand. There is no person who does not frequent a warm bath at least three times a week, and during the winter, daily, if he possibly can. Every man of rank or wealth has one in his house for his own use, so the stock of wood would soon provide inadequate, whereas these stones are wonderfully abundant and cheap. Chapter 31 of the Khan's Magnanimity Towards the Poor It has already been pointed out that the Emperor distributes large quantities of grain to his subjects. We shall now speak of his great charity to and care of the poor in the city of Kanbalik. Upon being told of members of a respectable family reduced to poverty by misfortune or unable because of illness to earn a living or raise a supply of any kind of grain, he gives them enough for a year's consumption. At the proper time, they present themselves before the officers who supervise such expenditures. Here, they declare the amount they received the previous year and receive the same for the current year. In a similar way, the emperor provides clothing for the poor, which he does from his tents, tithes of wool, silk, and hemp. He has these materials woven into various sorts of cloth in a building erected for that purpose, where every artisan is obliged to work one day a week for his majesty. Garments thus manufactured he orders to be given to the poor families above described, as they are needed for their winter and summer clothes. He also has armies, and in every city has woolen cloth woven and has it paid for, paid for from the tenths levied at that place. Chapter 32 of the Emperor's Charity it should be realized that when the Tartars followed their original customs and had not yet adopted the religion of the idolaters, they never gave alms. The poor man applied to them. They drove him away, saying, Take yourself off along with the troubles God has sent you. Had he loved you as he loves me, he would have provided for you. But since the wise men of the idolaters, and especially the Bashiks already mentioned, have taught his majesty that providing for the poor is a good work and highly acceptable to their deities, he has helped them in the manner stated. 
and at his court no one is denied food. Not a day passes in which 20,000 bowls of rice, millet, and panicum are not distributed by regular officers. By reason of this immense and astonishing liberality towards the poor, the people all adore the great Khan. Chapter 33 of the Astrologers of the City of Kanbalik There are in the city of Kanbalik, including Christians, Saracens, and Cathayans, about 5,000 astrologers and soothsayers, for whom the emperor provides just as he does for the poor and who constantly practice their art. They have their astrolabes, upon which are indicated the planetary signs, timetables, and aspects for the whole year. The astrologers of each sect annually study their respective tables in order to ascertain the course of the heavenly bodies and their respective positions in each moon. From the paths of the planets, in the different signs, they predict whether and foretell the peculiar phenomena each month will produce. For instance, they predict that there will be thunder and storms in one month, earthquakes in another, lightning and violent rains in another, and pestilence, war, discord, and conspiracies in still another. As they find the signs in their astrolabes, so they declare what will come to pass, adding, however, that God, according to his good pleasure, may do more or less than they have set down. They write their predictions for the year on small squares in books called Tequin, and these they sell for a groat apiece to all persons who wish to peep into the future. Those whose predictions are found to be most often correct are esteemed the greatest masters of their art and are consequently the most honored. When any person planning some major enterprise or a distant journey for business purposes or any undertaking wants to know what success it is likely to have, he has recourse to one of these astrologers and inquires in what disposition the heavens will be at the time. The latter thereupon tells him that before he can answer he must know the year, the month, and the hour in which he was born. Having learned these, he determines how the person's horoscope corresponds with the aspect of the heavens at the time the inquiry was made. Upon this, he grounds his prediction of the outcome of the undertaking. It should be observed that the Tartars divide the time into a cycle of twelve years. The first they give the name of lion, for the second the ox, the third the dragon, the fourth the dog, and so on the rest of twelve. When a person is therefore asked in what year he was born, he replies that it was, for example, in the year of the lion, upon such a day, at such an hour and minute all of which has been carefully recorded by his parents. At the end of the 12 years of the cycle, they repeat it. 